Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today to the CBA Municipal Court Pro Bono Panel. My name is Ann Hopkins Avery, and I am the Manager of Professional Development here at Vetter Price. And we're so pleased to have many of you from both Vetter as well as from other firms. So thanks for coming, and thanks to all of the uh, speakers um, as well. Just a few logistics. I want to make sure that um, everyone is aware of where the restrooms are located. So if you walk out the door and you take a left, the first right, you will find a men's and a ladies room. And also, I want to make sure everyone has signed in. There is a sign-in sheet outside of this room on a table. And we ask that you please sign in and sign out so that the CBA can offer and provide you with the requisite CLE credit. The program has been accredited for 2.75 hours of professionalism credit. So without further ado, um, I will turn things over to Judge Wright. And thanks so much for coming. Good afternoon. I was asked to say thank you to Vetter Price. When I was in law school, I saw that name Vetter Price as a firm. It sounds so impressive. I never got an offer to come. I'll go there, but I always like the sound of the name Vetter Price. And so it's an honor to be here today in their facility, just to be able to say hello to those of you. Megan always provides a script for me to say, because she doesn't want me to go over board, because I'm going to start begging you before I end with this. I've started a flex call, and I need pro bono workers 8 o'clock in the morning and 5 in the afternoon. Now, I know you're still working at that hour. You're still billing somebody. We're hoping you just pause for one hour and come and help us. Thank you. The Municipal Court Pro Bono Program is a partnership between the Circuit Court of Cook County and the Chicago Bar Association, Carpels, the Chicago Legal Clinic, and 13 area law firms. The purpose of the program is to provide pro bono representation to low-income litigants in the Municipal Court Division. In the Municipal Court Division, we have about 40,000 eviction cases filed each year. We have about 60,000 on the roll of torts contracts non-jury. We have less than that, probably about 20,000 in the jury portion that we have to deal with. And more and more every day. That's why I thank you guys so much for what you do because more and more we have more pro se's who believe they're lawyers. They don't, it's hard to talk to them sometimes. They're not very grateful very often. If those of you have tried it, you know that. But all you know you're doing God's work. That's the only thing that helps you as you do this work. The lawyer responsibility to ensure access to legal system and advance that, that objective through this pro bono program. Advan access to, the reason I like the, what you do is access to the courts is more than allowing a person to stand up before the bench and present whatever they know. If you don't understand what you're doing, we hope that somebody is in the room to help you understand. I don't like to be that person myself. I don't like to be the person who deprives a lawyer of his skills and what he's there for. I'd rather have someone else there to help that person do what they have to do rather than myself. That's okay. Let's let him talk. Let him talk. Let him do it. And the lawyer's upset because he also came, or she also came, for a purpose, and that is to defend and represent their own client and get the best results they can. And when a judge is sitting and saying, that's okay, let him say whatever they have to say, and objection, objection. No, let him talk. That is not the way we would hope to do it, because we are supposed to be the people who sit and work the rules the law that's what we're here for the case type the program is focused on municipal court cases claim involving 30,000 or less including small claims in which jury demands have been filed and one party is proceeding as a pro se since the program was started two years ago the program volunteers have helped over 55 low-income clients that's a large number and for those of you even if you took five cases each you wouldn't even dent it it's so many people here. I don't know whether the economy got it all started since 2006, 2007. It's been going. But even before that, we had a large number. But we're so noticeable now that we have the economy and people are coming in to my offices on an average of about 125 a day that's looking for waivers of fees. And when they leave waivers, and they have some lawyers who misuse them when they get those waivers 
but that's what they're coming in for, and they're trying best they can to do it themselves. And some of these cases, they must know from their common sense without any legal training that some of these cases that they have done, they've committed the act, they've borrowed the money, they've charged on the charge cards, they have run up telephone bills, they've done all these simple things and to waste the money, in my opinion, to try to fight that kind of thing when a lawyer could better advise that person as to what their rights are. And that's the only thing we're there to protect the rights of the indigent. Justice Hughes said that the Supreme Court and the courts of appeal will take care of themselves, that those people who go to those courts can manage and afford those courts. It's the courts of the poor that we must protect. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kathy Schneider. I am a supervising attorney for Carpels. So you think, well, what the heck is Carpels? Well, we're a great organization with a horrible name. Carpels stands for Coordinated Advice and Referral Program for Legal Services. We're a nonprofit, and we started out as a hotline to provide free legal help to people who, have, uh, who are in Cook County or have legal problems in Cook County. Our services have broadened beyond the hotline, and we also staff and, uh, and manage several help desks at the Daily Center. One of those is the MCAT, or the Municipal Court Advice Desk, and that's what I do. Um, I've been practicing since 1994, uh, mainly in civil litigation, and I've been managing the Municipal Court Advice Desk for Carpels for the last five and a half years. Uh, it's, we are funded by the Chicago Bar Foundation and by the court. We're very grateful for their funding so that we can provide free help to people who are coming into that court and have legal matters um, before judges in the municipal department. The Cook County Circuit Court is set up into three departments. One of those is municipal, and the municipal department uh, is it handles lots of different kinds of cases, but generally civil cases uh, where the addendum is $30,000 or less. The municipal department also has uh, suburban divisions, two through six, or districts, I should say. They handle cases a little higher. Uh, what do I do? I see people who are coming in on a daily basis with municipal cases in their hands. Lots of them have been sued. There's an M case, and they don't know what the heck to do. They have a hard time getting in the building and figuring their way around, and luckily they end up with us to give them some advice about what their rights are. Uh, a couple of years ago, one of the jury judges, uh, Donnelly, proposed to the Bar Foundation, and uh, including Carpels, that he was seeing lots of pro se litigants in the jury courtrooms, and those were people who could use some help, and maybe some folks like you uh, might be interested in getting some experience in handling some jury cases. So because we're there providing assistance to these folks anyway, we're a good place to start the referral. So I guess I'm really sort of the second person in the line of referrals in this program that you're here to learn about today. Uh, Cases are filed, obviously, some with a jury demands and some uh, cases that will just go through for bench trial. When cases have a jury demand, they're transferred to courtroom 1501. This is downtown. And Judge Snyder is the supervising judge there and uh, handles all the jury demand cases until they have gone through arbitration. Um, you're going to hear more about mandatory arbitration in a moment. So he is one of the judges that will refer pro se litigants to our help desk uh, to see if maybe there's somebody that would qualify for this program for your help. There are also, after arbitration, several judges who handle the trials. And those judges can also refer cases to our desk uh, for possible referral to you guys. So we actually sit at the courthouse on the sixth floor. And what do I do? I talk to people all day long who have legal problems. What I'll do to start is Get, gather as many facts as I can about what's going on to try to analyze do, does this person have good claims and or defenses? Do they have evidence that will support their claims or their defenses? Is this somebody who is um, going to be reliable, who has an interest in her case or her defenses, and who will make a potentially good witness on her own behalf? So we will look at all of those things, make sure that they qualify as um, an indigent person for the program, and if it looks like they do, then we'll make a referral. Um, and what you'll ultimately see in that referral are all my notes 
uh, it's an electronic referral about the information we've gathered. We will also try to make copies of as many of the documents as we can um, for the referral. And then it goes to Megan McClung, who's the liaison uh, for the, the rest of the referral pro process. We're available for questions as you go forward. Um, and just real quickly, well, I, I'm going to turn it over to Megan. She'll give you a better idea of the types of cases that we've been seeing uh, getting referred into the program. Thanks, Kathy. Um, hello, my name is Megan McClung. Uh, we are taping this today, um, so hence why we have our microphones on. Um, I am known as the CBA liaison for the program, or better known as your cruise director. Um, I am the point person for anything that you need, um, including starting with the training today. If a, place, uh, if a case is placed with you and you have any questions, you can come to me. I've been an attorney practicing since 1998. I am a contract attorney through the Chicago Bar Association, and I help run two pro bono programs, one of which is the one you're learning about today. And it's such a unique program uh, that we started two years ago with the help of the municipal court, with uh, Carpels, as well as several law firms who were in the pilot program at first. And I really want to take this moment to thank Better Price for hosting this fourth training that we've had uh, for this program and all of you attorneys for attending here today. Um, the purpose of the program is really to provide pro se litigants with limited means of access to justice with an attorney. And for the attorney, a good experience at either an arbitration or at a jury trial. And when it comes to screening criteria, um, that's where Carpels uh, make sure that the cases uh, screen for poverty level, a couple other factors. But one of the two big ones they look for is A, are the adverse parties represented by counsel? Because we try to keep it a level playing field. Um, and then the, the second is, um, is there a jury demand? Because we're taking cases that there's only jury demands filed on. Um, because we want to provide you with this great experience of going into court. Because um, as you heard, there's uh, many, many pro se litigants out there. And you know, we're, just, we're trying to help in one area here, and we're trying to expand the program um, into others as well. Um, I want to tell you about three things about the program, and that is about the cases that you will typically see, the training, which you're here today and you're going to experience for yourself, and then the support you'll receive after this training. And the cases are typically what we've seen, auto accident cases where the amounts are very low in controversy, so low that the private bar um, isn't interested in taking the case, cannot afford to really take these cases. Um, and there's no other legal aid agency that will pick them up. And so we have a lot of auto accident cases. Um, we also have a lot of breach of contract, malpractice, and other property damage sort, uh, torts and types of cases like that. Um, the mock case that you will be seeing demonstrations on today, what you'll get to practice your own arbitration, is based on a real case that was referred to this program. And it's very typical of the information that you would receive and what you would handle. Um, so for the training, and now moving on to point two, what's this training about today? Well, we want to first introduce you to this program. We want to show you how to handle a Muni case once you take one on, and what to expect and how to handle it. And we've tried to really break it down based on the feedback we've gotten from volunteers over the last two years and what it is they wish they were trained on. And so I welcome you to reach out to me at any time and say, hey, Megan, I wish we had more uh, um, talks on how to handle these uh, liens that are on cases. Because that was a big one. Is, uh, we had volunteers coming back to us and saying, now I'm going to trial. How do I prove up my damages? So we have a piece on that. And we also have a great piece in the materials before you on that topic as well. Um, and at the training today, you're going to break out for 35 minutes around 4 o'clock. And you should have received in front of you the, the breakout room chart. If you can find your name on it, we'll help direct you to where the room is in better price. And that's where you'll get to practice your mark, mock arbitration. You're also going to see three demonstrations up here, two of which are handled by um, judges from municipal court that we're very grateful to have with us today. You're also going to see a mock arbitration um, demonstrated by 
um, two experienced arbitrators as well as two attorneys who are very experienced in performing arbitrations. Um, and then after today, once you leave, what type of support will you continue to get? Well, I'm your point of contact. And so if everybody could just take their pen for one second, I want to direct you to my contact information. And it's tab 2, page 5 in your materials. And that's tab 2, page 5 at the very bottom. It has my phone number and my email. I welcome your questions anytime. And anytime I can't answer your questions based on my own experience in municipal court for 10 years, I have advisors, most of which you see here today, that will help answer your questions. So you are fully supported. We also have a web page that's chock full of information, um, sample documents, motions, motions for leave to amend, jury instructions. So we want to provide you with as much support as we can. So uh, that's sort of wrapping up my piece here. Again, any questions anytime after this, please reach out to me. Um, I'd like to now introduce um, Elise Wu, who was a volunteer for us and handled a case. She has a great uh, experience from this program. And before we get into how to handle a case, I thought you'd like to hear what it's like to do a case first from a volunteer. Thank you. Um. Hi everyone, uh, as Megan said, my name is Elise. I'm a second year associate at Kirkland and Ellis. I took on a small claims ac auto accident case representing the plaintiff last year, and it wrapped up with a nice settlement in the fall. Um, when I started the case, I realized quickly something that I think a lot of volunteers through this program do, which is that this really isn't anything like the other cases that you're on. Um, for one thing, you're in a court that very few people, if any at your firm, are going to be familiar with, and it's going to be on you to kind of do a lot from scratch. Um, I think during the beginning phase of this case, I actually had to sit down and read through the Illinois Supreme Court rules on discovery multiple times. I honestly don't even know how many I read through, how many times I read through them. Um, in addition, you're kind of used to cases where the other side has a lot at stake too and is putting forth effort in line with that. It's kind of a totally new experience for me to uh, be basically ignored by the other side, to be working across the table from people who didn't seem to care at all what happened in the case because it was just small beans to them. In fact, people who seemed to take offense to the fact that I cared and was working on the case. Um, being unfamiliar with the court, though, was definitely our biggest challenge from the get-go. There are judgment calls that you kind of have to make about how to proceed, and it can be hard knowing how to go about tackling your case without coming off unreasonable or irritating the judge when you don't know much about the court and how things work there. Um, we faced a call like this when we started thinking about discovery. I think you're going to hear more about um, this issue later on. Uh, but for us, we knew that you don't get discovery as of right in a small claims matter and that parties actually typically don't seek it because it is expensive and usually it, it can be um, you know, sort of uh, the wrong decision to make based on how much is at stake. But um, for us, it just didn't seem like the best way to represent our client to let it go. We thought it was worthwhile trying to get some discovery from the other side. Now, the other side who does this case, type of case more often was, of course, pretty unhappy when we moved for discovery. And they were even less happy when our judge granted us full discovery. Um, I'm pretty certain they moved from unhappy to just really pissed off when they realized that we weren't going to let them slide on their discovery responses. They'd been sending us pretty clearly deficient responses and seemed to assume that we would just like roll over and take it, but we weren't just going to let it go. Um, I wound up having to drag them back into court twice uh, after they refused to respond to any of my calls or letters about their responses. The first time was on a motion to compel, and the judge agreed with me then that they were wrongfully withholding documents by claiming a privilege that didn't actually exist. Uh, the second time was when they refused to follow the judge's order on my motion to compel and still wouldn't give us our discovery. Now, by that point, we kind of figured out that this was how it was going to go, so we were ready for it, and the day after um, the deadline passed for them to comply with their discovery obligations, I had a motion for sanctions and contempt ready to go and filed it that afternoon. Two days later, the judge granted my motion and entered a judgment of liability against the defendant so that the only issue to be tried was damages. Uh, the morning of trial, the other side came in and, of course, tried to get the judge to vacate that order. Uh, we argued back and forth a lot about it, and um, 
the other side basically just put me through the same abuse that I've been through for most of the case. Um, stood there silently while they yelled things like, um, she doesn't know what she's doing, she's out of her element, this is a small claims matter, this is ridiculous, I don't even know why we're here. And um, luckily I'd been through that same litany enough times that it kind of uh, washed over me. And it was nice to see that the judge didn't seem to agree with what they were saying either. She denied their request and ordered them to immediately comply with their discovery obligations. Perhaps more importantly, she actually hand wrote into the order that we were free to file a petition for fees because of the whole discovery debacle. So I'd been trying to get in touch with the other side for the entirety of the case. I called, I left messages, I sent letters, and just nothing. Um, a week after getting this order from the judge, though, of course, I started getting all kinds of contact from the other side. I mean, I got you know, calls, emails, even text messages, which seemed a strange way to practice to me. Um, but you know, ultimately, we got them to agree to pay nearly the full value of the suit to settle it and to make our fee petition go away. So I remember um, when I first got the case, I was talking to my partner about how to handle it. And he said something like, you know, at least the squeaky wheel gets the grease and I want to be the squeakiest wheel they've ever dealt with. And it was, I don't know, it seemed like a very weird thing to say to me at the time. But as we started working on this case, I learned that sometimes that's what you have to do. It's the attitude you have to take. My client was a man with two kids who was a food delivery guy. After the accident, he had a ton of medical bills that he couldn't pay and his car had been totaled. So to do his job, he had to borrow his mom's car. And it had been going like this for over a year at that point. Now he just wanted back what the accident cost him so he could move on with his life. Um, but the other side just didn't see him that way. They saw this, somebody who was just a poor person suing for a small amount of money whose case wasn't really worth anyone's time. And, you know, that just wasn't how it was. The, the case was worth a lot to our client, and we had to do what we did to make them pay attention to us. Being the squeaky wheel can be a lot of work. The other side's going to try to throw you off and make you feel like an idiot because you're not, you know, playing ball the way things are done. Um, but sometimes that is what you have to do to stand up for your client. It worked out well for ours, and it felt so nice to be able to tell him that he was going to be able to pay off his bills and buy a new car and finally just heal from what this accident had cost him. So um, as you can tell, probably, I've had a really great experience volunteering through the program. I think it's not only nice to be able to help out somebody who you know, might otherwise be really taken advantage of, but also you know, from your own career perspective, to be able to run your own case as somebody very junior. Um, and you might even get the fun experience I did, which is being a first-year associate, defending your first deposition against a named partner at another firm. So, you know, it really is, um, it really is a, a good thing to do, not only personally, I think, you know, for your own kind of sense of giving back, but also professionally. So. Are we allowed to ask two questions? Sure. Um, two questions. I'm a director of pro bono at one of the firms in the city. Okay. So one of the concerns that our firm would have is about how many hours would you devote to the representation of the case? Hmm. Approximately. Um, my case was a little bit different than probably the typical one. I came in after an arbitration had already been completed, so there, it had already been referred to a trial room. From that phase on until the end of it, I would guess maybe 100 hours over the course of a few months. Um, certainly much heavier at the beginning, especially because we did go for discovery, and then towards the end when we had a trial date set prepping for trial. But it's not... You know, it wasn't all-consuming time, and it didn't make it so I couldn't work on my other matters. Okay, and then the second question is, I take it you waived your fees in order for getting the case settled? Yes. Yes, we did. Although, obviously, with the petition for fees, we would have we would have likely donated the money, but we would have put, you know, our fee amounts in there. Mm -hmm. Who, uh, if any, <laughs> were you kind of consulting with? Well, Megan, of course, was a great resource, and as she said, there are a few um, attorneys uh, who kind of help out as advisors to people in the program, in addition to the resources I had at Kirkland. So um, John Leovi was actually a great resource for me. I don't know if he's 
speaking today? Okay, he's a, an attorney with the city um, and just had like a lot of good advice for how to navigate around the state court system. And I also had um, a good friend at another law firm who'd taken on a muni court case before me. So he'd sort of been through the same process I was going through a few months ahead. That was a big help. Did your firm encourage you and provide support? Um, I think they did. Uh, you know, granted it was a little bit tough because we didn't have many people who'd been in the Daily Center litigating much, but I had a supervising partner who kind of helped me as far as a lot of the judgment calls are concerned and, you know, how to handle witness interviews and deaths and things like that. Any? Okay. Did it ever go to No, it didn't. Uh, as soon as sort of the fee petition w option was out there, they just paid up the full amount basically. And with that sanctions order, did you actually send the opposing counsel a, a, a invoice or a pro forma from Kirkland with 100 plus hours of your? <laughs> we were uh, actually the day we were about to send that over was when I started getting phone calls and you know all that contact. So we would have it was ready to go, but they knew it was coming. <laughs> yeah. Okay. If there are no other questions. Um, uh, you know, you've got my name in the program. My email address is just. Elise.wu at Kirkland.com. I'm very happy to answer any questions down the line or talk to you as you start a case. So please feel free to reach out to me. Okay, you get me again. Uh, we're moving on to Roman numeral four. First steps in managing a typical pro bono case. And I'm going to discuss communication and managing expectations with your clients. Uh, first, I just want to mention, um, Megan did briefly mention that you'll, you'll have access to a portal at IllinoisProBono.org um, where your materials will, will be, there will be other um, information and learning tools there. There are three websites um, affiliated with each other, Illinois Legal Aid, Illinois Legal Advocate, and Illinois Pro Bono. I don't know if any of you has had the opportunity to visit any of them, especially Illinois Legal Aid. It's a public website it's chock full of information for pro se litigants to try to figure out how to solve some of their legal problems on their own. It's really cool. You should check it out sometime. There are also fillable forms. In relationship to those two websites are Illinois Legal Advocate, which is a website for lawyers like me who are in legal services to get information and training on uh, collaboration. And then the third website is one that you people can use. It's called IllinoisProBono.org. There is a portal there that is about this program, and you can also do legal research there. There is a small article that I wrote called Auto Accidents Manual, and some of what I'm going to touch on today is in there in more detail. So at some point, if you do get an auto case, some of it might prove useful to you. Okay. Um, I think that generally the people that you are going to be helping will be very grateful for your help. Um, we're, from a referral standpoint, we're going to try to refer people who are really vested in their claims or defenses and are going to uh, be there uh, and hopefully very responsive and want your help. So generally they're going to be very helpful. Sometimes you get a grump, um, but you'll work through that. Uh, I think to start you want to listen and develop a relationship of mutual respect and trust. Uh, now I say listen, but I say that with a little bit of caution because sometimes our clients tend to sort of ramble on and in a certain degree you want to be able to direct those conversations. So uh, you want to do as much fact gathering you can from the documents we send and the referral information we give you uh, so that you have a good list of questions. And I think sometimes by questioning people you're going to get most of what you need to understand what their claims and defenses are. So having a good list of questions is a great starting point. Um, be prepared and write your questions down. Uh, I happen to have handled a lot of motor vehicle accidents uh, in litigation in my practice. I worked um, for a small firm that did a lot of insurance defense work for State Farm, so I'm really familiar with these cases. We, I did some uh, insurance work as well. And I think one of the first things you want to have to help you in a motor vehicle case, and I'm going to kind of use that as an example for this topic, um, is you want to get the police report. If we can get it in our meeting, we will, and it will be part of what you guys receive. But the police report is going to give you the names and dates of birth of many of the parties, so you can do your conflict checking. It will give you information about whether or not somebody has insurance. It will give you the date of the accident, the time of the accident, the place of the accident. Uh, there might be witnesses listed on your police report, people that you might want to subpoena and take depositions of. 
Uh, so you're going to get a lot of great information. You can get from the police department a key so you can see what some of the fields mean, like where people are positioned in cars, where the impact take pl takes place on the cars. Um, so that's a really great starting point. Uh, fact gathering with your client. You want to ask a lot of specific questions about where were you coming from before the accident happened? Where were you going? Whose car were you driving? Did you have permission? Were you doing anything for the person who owned the car? Uh, what road were you traveling on? What direction were you going? What was the weather like? What were the street conditions like? Was it light or dark? Was there overhead lighting? Was it at an intersection? Were there traffic controls? How many lanes in your direction? How many lanes in the other direction? Uh, so you want to break it down like that and really, really help you understand whether or not your client's version holds water. Because they may be saying, oh, it's all the other guy's fault. But when you break it down this way, you're going to have a much better understanding of, well, maybe it was a lot their fault, but maybe there were some things that you should or shouldn't have been doing as well. Um, I have a pretty comprehensive list of some of those ideas of questions you want to ask in that little article I referred to before at IllinoisProBono.org. Um, Lindsay Markley is going to talk to you later on about injuries and damages and proving those up. But at the beginning of your interview, you're wanting to get facts about injuries. So if you're, if you're representing a plaintiff who has injuries, you're going to want to ask questions about, you know, again, where were you in the car when the impact happened? What part of your body, if any, struck what part of the car? You know, did your chest hit the steering wheel? Did your head hit anything? Um, did an ambulance come? Did you see anybody get in the ambulance? Did you see anybody talking to the ambulance personnel? Did you see anybody walking around? You know, you may be defending somebody and your client says, yeah, I saw the other guy. He was walking around talking and yelling and screaming and uh, he looked fine to me. He didn't have a scratch and he looked perfectly fine. He didn't look dizzy. So those are all going to be really important questions to ask in your fact gathering phase. I want to add two things before I finish. Um, the clients that we serve can tend to be a little transient. So you do want to make sure that when you ha conduct your interview, you get lots of contact information, get a backup phone number, get the names of some friends or, rel or relatives who they believe are reliable, get their phone numbers and addresses. Tell the client to stay in touch with you if they move, give you their new address. Uh, we call clients and their phones, you know, they've run out of minutes uh, or their phones are turned off. They move. So you want to make sure you have some backup contact information so you can get a hold of them. The other thing I would, like, I would recommend is that you make sure you keep good file records for when you do contact your client. Make sure your, contact, your client knows of all the court dates. Uh, if the client's in court with you, give them a copy of the court order so they know when the next court date is. Follow up with a letter when you leave or when you get back to your office, uh, reminding them of the court date. Um, communication is going to be your best tool for providing great client services. Uh, I think, you know, lack of communication is probably most clients' biggest problem with their lawyers. So staying in contact with them, demanding that they stay in contact with you is going to be really important and make sure you keep good notes of what you're doing uh, to keep track of that. Thanks. Good afternoon. My name is Ann Cote, and I'm a fourth year associate at Neil Gerber and Eisenberg. Um, I have taken on two cases through this program, one of which um, I took until arbitration, and the other I took through full arbitration and through a full jury trial. Um, both of them were uh, great clients, hardworking people, and like Elise um, shared with her experience, um, they really needed representation to get through um, what can be kind of a circus in Muni Court. So I was happy to take on that role. Um, <clears throat> I'm tasked today with helping you to kind of check off the basics when you first take a case through this program. And for some of you, this may um, be something you already know or maybe intuitive, but certainly for those new attorneys or transactional attorneys, some of the things that you need to do on the outset may not be uh, as clear. So the first thing you'll need to do once you're assigned a case is to file an appearance with the court. Um, obviously, the reason to do this is to put everyone on notice that your client is now being represented 
And it's also a good opportunity for you to let your client know that you need copies of everything your client's received up until that point and to make sure that if your client continues to receive um, notices or documents that you address that problem right away. In one of my cases, even after filing my appearance, the um, counsel on the other side continued to send information and documents to my client and oftentimes I was delayed in responding because it was difficult to get those right away. Um, so you'll just want to make sure that that's taken care of uh, as soon as possible. To do that, you're going to file a, um, an appearance and jury demand form. You shouldn't need to address the issue of jury demand um, as it should have already been made. But if your client was the one that made the jury demand, you will have the right to waive their, uh, their right to a jury later on if you feel that that's necessary and or appropriate. Also keep in mind that clients in this program, of course, are generally eligible for fee waivers. So you'll want to make sure that you file a representation by a civil legal services provider. I believe both the appearance form and the civil legal services provider forms are in your documents. So just make sure those get on file um, kind of as your step one to make sure that you're um, on, on the record as being a representation for, the, for your client. Uh, the second thing you'll want to do is take a look at the complaint. And there's an example complaint in your materials, and just to demonstrate the point, I'm actually going to read to you the, the complaint um, that you've got in your mock case. I'm filing this complaint because I was in contact with American Access after the incident, and when I sent the police report to them, I had no contact after that. I tried calling for two weeks with no response. When I was first in contact with them, they said they would only pay 85% of the damage in the insured. Michael Smith is 100% responsible for the damage to my car. As you can see, there are some missing components to the complaint. So it's going to be your job to amend the complaint to make sure the court knows exactly what's going on. What's your cause of action? What are the key facts? Um, have you established proper jurisdiction and venue? Have you specified damages and requested uh, costs? You may even want to add or, or uh, remove a defendant and or a cause of action um, depending on your circumstances. It's, it's really your job to take what's been filed and turn it into something uh, that will be truly useful to the judge and that will cover all of your client's interests. Almost all of the pro se complaints will need to be repleted, so you'll have to file a motion to seek leave to do that. Um, I believe that most of the judges will allow that to be made uh, by an oral motion, but if you are required to file a written motion seeking leave, there is an example of that in your packet. And keep in mind when you're uh, filing that motion, typically, I believe you're, you're including a full copy of your amended complaint. So you're asking the judge for leave to amend it and alongside it giving him the complaint uh, as amended. Uh, I believe it's been mentioned that most of the cases coming through are going to be negligence or breach of contract causes of action. Obviously these are all fact dependent, um, but you'll just want to make sure you really drill down and sort out exactly what your client's complaint is. Um, so of course that's that's representing a plaintiff, and if you're representing a defendant, uh, you may want to answer the complaint. Now, under the Supreme Court rules, if it's a small claim where the damages are under $10,000, no answer is required. But you'll want to make sure you look to see if there are any affirmative defenses or potentially a counterclaim. Um, of course, you're still filing an appearance, even if you decide you don't need to file an answer. But if you do decide you need to file an answer, um, you'll want to go through the same type of process that you'd go through representing a plaintiff, gather the facts, and make sure you, you've documented and filed with the court any potential affirmative defenses or um, counterclaims. And then, of course, as you go through the discovery with your client and maybe new facts reveal new affirmative defenses, you can seek leave to amend your answer to include those. Um, 
I believe those are the key points in just getting the ball rolling. Of course, Megan is a great resource to answer any questions. And um, my only point, last point, would be that if you feel once you're in Muni Court that you have no idea what you're doing, just imagine what your client is going to feel or would feel without your representation. So it's a great program, and uh, I hope that you enjoy it. Hi, everybody. My name is Anna Ganas O'Connor. Feel free to call me Annie. It's a little bit easier. Um, I'm here to talk to you about discovery and its limitations. First, I want to give you a little bit of my background. Um, I started um, right out of law school. I started working at Perillo Iso Halloran. I was there for three years, and after about 50 jury trials to verdict, I thought I was ready to move on. So from there, I went to Siegel McCambridge Singer Mahoney four years ago, and now I practice uh, medical product liability and toxic tort defense. Um, I also serve as an arbitrator for Cook County, and I've been doing that for the past four years as well. So regarding discovery and its limitations, Judge Wright mentioned that for muni cases, generally the addendum um, filed is about $30,000 or less. You do sometimes have higher addendums when a case from law division gets transferred by the judge in law division to muni court. And also, despite the addendum being $30,000 or less, obviously a plaintiff can ask for well over that in muni court at a jury trial. We've seen verdicts up to over $100,000 there. So just to let you know, it's not sometimes always as small as you may think. Um, still very much a courtroom and a trial room and same rules of evidence apply, same, um, same ways to pick a jury. It's very real. So please keep that in mind. Um, now regarding discovery and its limitations, small claims case immunity is $10,000 or less. So if it's a small claims matter, there's generally no discovery. However, as you heard earlier from Elise, there are certain circumstances when you may want to request and have leave to file or to um, file written discovery or to pr um, prepare some discovery and um, oral depositions. There's a couple of circumstances that I can give you as an example just to kind of give you um, an idea of when you might want to use these methods. Um, for instance, if you're going to be representing a plaintiff in these ac uh, car accident cases, for instance, and I'd like to um, point your, your attention to a parked car case. So let's put you in the position of um, your potential client. You wake up, you go outside, you go to your car, run some gro uh, go get some groceries or go to work, and you notice a huge dent in the back of your car because someone hit your car in the middle of the night and you don't know who that person is. You later find out via witness or some other way that um, uh, the owner of the vehicle or the driver of the vehicle, but you don't know that driver is necessarily the owner of the vehicle. You only have an, one name. So in those circumstances, if you file a suit, you may want to ask the judge for leave to reopen discovery for the limited purpose of determining whether or not you sued the correct party. If you sued the driver, the driver not necessarily be a correct party. You would also need the owner of the vehicle in some situations. Some situations, you don't need the driver. It really depends. But you would need to determine that because if you sue the owner and the driver is not mentioned, case dismissed. So please keep that in mind. There's also other situations as well. Um, if there's a multi-car accident, let's say a three-car rear-ender or just a you know, big damage somewhere else in the highway, for instance, there's a lot of cars involved, you might want to reopen discovery to determine liability so you can proceed with your case. Um, also, in the event that there's a bodily injury or a heavy property damage case, whether it's a total loss, for instance, and the vehicle's damage was too much to uh, fix and it was just easier to total the vehicle out based on the value of the vehicle, you might want to retain an expert to determine the total loss to prove your case if you were to go to arbitration or trial. So those are just some situations. There's obviously other situations where you may want to ask the judge to reopen discovery. Um, and it's obviously a case-by-case -case basis whether he or she would grant that or not. And in some situations, you might not need to reopen at all. So. Um, do you have any questions on that? Okay, thank you very much. Also, uh, through this program, if you ever have any questions, I'm available. My email is agoconnor at smsm.com if you have any questions. And thanks for volunteering. Yes.
I mean, there's several law firms that would practice um, that I bumped into in Muni Court when I was practicing there. Um, but, but regarding car accident cases, you generally see the same players, so to speak. However, I mean, there's honestly probably 30 different law firms involved that, you're, that are regular players in the field, so to speak. So um, I'm sure any one of us would have definitely encountered one of your opponents that you're going to have in a case, and we'd be able to help direct you into how to contact them and the best methods to use in that perspective. Any other questions? Thank you. Hi, I'm Shelba Patel. I work for the city of Chicago. I um, did work in the municipal division for about three, four years. Um, recently transferred to the law division, doing my, most of my work up there. But I've had a lot of experience in 1501 working for the city. I'm in 1501. I was in 1501 on a daily basis, so I know a lot about this kind of stuff. I've been asked to speak about a couple of issues. The first one is. A lot of you may end up trying your cases in front of a jury with more than one attorney at the bench. And it might seem unfair. It might be used by your opponent to make it seem like they're, you are ganging up against their client. And a couple of things, at the city we tend to try cases in pairs. And one of the first things we do is we do a motion eliminate on the issue. There is no probative value for your opponent to bring up the fact that there are two attorneys representing your client while there may only be one attorney representing their client. But in the event that that motion is denied, one of the things you, I mean, the best thing I think to do would be to explain it to the jury. A lot of cases, you guys may be new and young, and that's why you're working in pairs. I mean, you want to represent your clients just as the best possible way you can. So I would explain it to the jury, but I wouldn't highlight it too much. If your motion eliminate is granted, I wouldn't touch it at all. Um, and Annie talked about discovery in small claims cases. Obviously, discovery is not allowed in small claims cases. That's part of the benefit of trying your case in small claims. But there are certain instances, Annie touched on some of them. In my experience, I had a case in which I had received a medical records from the plaintiff's counsel. And in it, it said that the plaintiff had fallen the previous day. I wanted to see his medical records. What did he injured? Why did he fall? Maybe there's another reason that he fell in the case that I was handling. So it's pretty easy. You know, you write a motion. It's pretty simple. You say, for the limited purpose, based on whatever knowledge you have, you'd like to reopen discovery for that, that purpose alone. Um, another thing you can do is you can talk to your, other, your opposing counsel there to get records if you want them. I mean, there are chances that your opposing counsel is interested in settling, and you can ask them for records so that you can determine whether or not you are interested in settling. Um, you know, there are a lot of public records available, too, that you can request without going through formal subpoenas or discovery. Um, you know, if you have a good relationship with your opposing counsel, I would try asking for records. Uh, and finally, I was supposed to talk about discovery sanctions. I mean, I think uh, Elise talked about how she had a really, really contentious experience with her opposing counsel and he wasn't getting her, her discovery, re re responding to her discovery requests. I think the first step you should do is talk with your opposing counsel. Sometimes they may be like Elise's experience and just not interested in dealing with this case, but a lot of times they may be having trouble with their clients. Talk to them, see if you can work something out. But if they are going to be contentious, then the first start, you still have to talk to them. Talk to them after you make a phone call. Record that phone call in a letter. The letter will be useful when you do your motion to compel. Same thing with depositions. If they cancel a deposition, follow it up with a letter. Attach some exhibits to your motion to compel. Um, once you do file that motion, the court will likely grant it if you show that you have tried. You know, you've done it properly. You've sent your discovery requests. They haven't responded at the appropriate time. You've scheduled depositions. They haven't gotten their depositions. They haven't presented their clients for depositions. The important thing to remember in municipal court, which doesn't exist in the law division, is that there is an all discovery closure date. It usually comes about 30 days after your first status in a case. You need to file that motion to compel before your all discovery closure date. Otherwise, you will waive any sort of compelling um, order or barring order. In the municipal division, there is a form order for compelling. 
in it there's self-executing language that says that if the person who's in violation of discovery does not present their client or provide written answers in the time scheduled within the order, that they will automatically be barred from presenting any evidence at arbitration or trial. So it's important that if you are going to pursue discovery sanctions, you do it before the all discovery closure date. Now, if you do seem to have a pretty good working relationship with your opposing counsel, the other alternative is, or if in your case, you're having a hard time with your client and he's not getting back to you with responses for discovery. In that case, you can also ask the court to extend your all discovery closure date. You know, my experience with 1501 is Judge Snyder or whoever else is sitting on the bench is pretty open to that. You know, they're not interested in doing hard sanctions or harsh sanctions against you, preventing you from re representing any evidence during arbitration or trial. So I would definitely work with first trying to work out with your opposing counsel. Second, see if you can extend discovery if you need to. Otherwise, file a motion to compel and make sure you do it before the all discovery closure date. Any questions? Next is Judge Snyder. Um, as you know, he's the presiding judge in 1501, and it's very uh, common for him to get tied up in the motions that occur at 2 o'clock. So what we'll do is we'll go next to our demonstration before a trial judge. We're very honored to have uh, Judge Diane Shelley with us today to demonstrate that before you. And uh, while she's coming up, I want to take this moment to just uh, clarify one thing. We've been talking about the types of cases, um, and we've been referring to them as mostly auto accident. Just remember that there's a whole bunch of cases we get, such as we've had dog bite, we've had um, poisoning in a restaurant cases, we've had medical malpractice, such as dental work that went wrong. Um, so we get a whole good variety of them. And I've kept very good statistics since we started this program, and what I have seen from the last two years is that when it comes to whether you're going to be plaintiff or defense, it's really the flip of a coin. We're about 50-50 on whether you're going to be plaintiff or defense, um, including auto accident cases. So uh, that's why when we present this program, we do talk about what it's like to compel discovery, what it's like to defend on the other side, or um, what it's like to answer a complaint or to amend a complaint. So we try to approach it both ways, and it is hard to encompass all of it in a short three-hour program. So if you have any questions afterwards, if you want to know more about the cases that we've seen and we've handled, I'm happy to talk to you about that after this program. But now I'd like to welcome uh, Judge Shelley. Well, good afternoon. First of all, I want to thank everyone that's participating in this program. I, I think you should uh, realize that what you're doing now is it guarantees that the system works. When everyone has a representative in the courtroom, then you know the system reaches its ultimate goal, and that is to do justice. So I really appreciate that you're interested in programs like this, and I encourage you to bring in your other colleagues also. My name is Judge Diane Shelley, and I am a trial judge in the first municipal district here doing civil cases. So Judge Snyder is going to come in, and he's going to tell you about the process in 1501. I know he's on his way because I spoke with him earlier. But we're going to assume for a second that you've made it through 1501 and you've been assigned to a trial judge. And you are given what is called a intake case management date. My first recommendation to you is to take that court appearance seriously. This is not a time to just show up in court and say, oh, okay, I'll see what data are given out. You are expected under Rule 218 to be familiar with your case. Do not go into a trial, court's, a trial judge's courtroom and not know the nature of your case. Now, I understand, given what you're doing, that there are some times that you will be caught by surprise. If that occurs and you're not familiar with all of the facts, then disclose that to the judge immediately. Let the judge know that this is a case that I received about two days ago, and judge, I'm, I'm trying to familiarize myself with the case, and would you consider granting a short continuance? I know I would have no problem with that, and the majority of the judges in the division would have no problem. But if you answer an uh, intake call, you should be familiar with the facts. If the case went to arbitration, you should be able to tell who was successful at arbitration, 
you should have some concept of what the award was. Because what this does is it tells the court whether or not this is a case that will resolve itself or will it be contested all the way to the end. Now, the most important thing in this courtroom is the 218 orders, and we're going to talk about those in a few minutes. I think I see one of the former attorneys that used to appear before me, but now she's in the law division. I, uh, but she, we're going to do a short demonstration. But again, I want to refer you to Supreme Court Rule 218. Read it from the beginning to the end. Good morning, counsel. Lindsay Markley on behalf of the plaintiff. Thank you. Shilpa Patel on behalf of the defendant. Good morning. This matter is coming on to be heard for intake. Could you tell me who won at arbitration? The plaintiff did. We were awarded $25,000. And I assume the defendant rejected the award. That is correct. The defendant rejected the award. Is there anything unusual about this case that I should know about from the beginning? No, Your Honor. This is a standard property damage case um, with only property damage at issue and actually no personal injury. Okay. Do we have any issues regarding the bills or the cost of repair? Um, yes, Judge. I have uh, certain amounts that are paid, um, a bill in the amount of $320 that my client paid in cash, and then two estimates that we will be bringing in expert um, car repairsmen to testify to at trial. Okay, defense? Your Honor, we ask that limited discovery be done regarding the estimates. Plaintiff needs to disclose who they will be bringing in. Um, no 213Fs have been done yet in this case, so we ask that plaintiff fill, respond with 213F interrogatories. Okay, in the 218 order, it does require 213 disclosure. Counsel, has, have you previously disclosed this information to your opponent? It was my understanding that we had, although for purposes of arbitration, we didn't bring them in because the, the bills are automatic, or pardon me, the um, estimates automatically came before the arbitrators. Okay, so you're telling me that your opponent is not caught by surprise. They're aware of who the expert will be at the time of trial. That is correct. I believe that we um, put someone generically in and not a specific name, um, but they have been aware that we were going to call someone with respect to the estimates. Your Honor, the yes. case was a small claims case, so no discovery has previously been done. Um, I thought we were in muni. Are we? We yeah. are muni. Oh. Still a small claims oh. case. Okay. okay. All right. So. Um, so no discovery had been done, so I'm asking that we be given leave under Section 7 of the order to propound 213F interrogatories and for responses to be done um, 14 days and 14 days thereafter. Okay. Both of you are aware that discovery closed prior to this case being transferred to this courtroom, and all discovery requests should have been submitted and completed by now. However, given the fact the plaintiff did not specifically disclose the name of the repair shop, I'm going to give you a little leadway here. What I'm going to do, counsel, how quickly can you get your request on file? I can do it within seven days. Okay, seven days does not sound unreasonable. How quickly can you respond, counsel? I can respond seven days thereafter. Okay, we're right on track. Now, the issue is whether or not I'm going to allow any type of discovery depositions at this late stage. For purposes of, the, I, I mean, counsel can tell me if, if she'd like to or not. However, the testimony will be limited to the amounts of the estimates and establishing the witness as an expert in the area of um, auto repair. So I don't know that that'll be necessary, but I'll leave that to counsel. Given that this is a small claims case, I'm reluctant to allow de depositions at this uh, juncture. What I will require is that you respond within seven days. You'll get an opportunity to review the response, and I'm going to set this matter for another status. I will not give it a trial date. I'll set it for another status. At that time, if you would like to bring any additional motions on the issue of discovery, I'll entertain them at that time, but you must have a basis because by then you will have had, you will have all the information necessary to determine whether or not a discovery deposition is necessary, not just desired, but necessary in order to proceed with this case. Any other issues we need to address at this time? No, no Judge Shelley, I think that's, I think we're good. Okay. Now, the other scenario is if we got to the point where we're setting a trial date. So let's assume that we're setting a trial date. Okay. By agreement, I want to select a trial date. You understand that in my courtroom, if you have an agreed upon trial date, then you're expected to be ready to proceed to trial on that date. No continuances will be granted 
unless there is extremely good cause shown to the court. The fact that you have not finished discovery as requested earlier will not be an excuse for continuing the trial date. Okay. January 3rd, well, well, I just went second. This is uh, June. I don't give trial dates that far out. And that's one thing I should mention to you. Right now, we're pleased to state that we have a turnaround now of about 60 to 90 days on these cases. So it's not like the old days, well, you, as you may have heard about, where a case lingered for a year. We're trying them within 60 to 90 days. So end of August, are you available, counsel? Um, no, Your Honor, I'm going to be on vacation for the month of August. Could we please move into September? The entire month, counsel? I am a plaintiff's attorney judge, so I don't work. <laughs> Thank you so much, Consul. She gets an entire month for vacation. Uh, defense, we're looking at September. I am hoping you're available during the month of September. I am, Your Honor, except for the second week of September. I'm already scheduled for trial. Okay, very good. So we have the first week of September. We're going to pick a date the first week of September, and it will be set for trial on that date at 930. On line 11 of your intake order, you should write in that all trial materials shall be delivered to the judge three days prior to trial. That includes the jury instructions, the motions in limine, and any evidence steps so that the court can rule up upon any objections in the evidence step. Now this is very important because plaintiff, I must have your jury instructions and you must provide your opponent with a copy of your jury instructions so that we will, will, will have reviewed them prior to the trial date. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. Counsel, you should also make sure your jury instructions are in my courtroom also on that date. Of Any, course, Your Honor. Anything else we need to address? No, Your Honor, and for the benefit of um, counsel, and we'll have a conference following, but I'd like to offer to do the majority of the jury instructions with her just doing the defense and I'll have those to the court and counsel within two weeks of our jury trial. Okay. And I assume that you have exchanged phone numbers because I would prefer that you discuss any controversies amongst yourselves, try to resolve them. I think you can resolve probably 80% and that the court should only have to rule on maybe two or three instructions at the time of the conference. Yes, Your Honor, we have. Okay. Anything yes, Your Honor. else? Okay. So that's uh, intake conference. Uh, one thing we did not do, we didn't talk about the facts of the case, but again, that's something that you should be familiar with. You should be able to tell, bring the court up to speed. Keep in mind, the court is not that familiar with the facts of the case because the court may, in some instances, not set it for trial, but decide that a pretrial is more appropriate because this is a case that could resolve itself short of going to trial. Or the court may even suggest or ask, well, are you willing to waive your demand for a jury trial? Uh, so let the court know the facts of the case. Um, again, I want to thank you. I see that Judge Snyder has snuck in, and so I'm going to relinquish the microphone to Judge Snyder. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. I just came from uh, down the street, the Supreme Court Commission on Access to Justice is meeting for their first district listen, listening concert. Uh, most of the Supreme Court is there. Most of the first district appellate court is there. All of the deans of all the law schools are there and all kinds of people are there and uh, from the public, from all the legal aid community. And they're all aware that you are here because I told them that's where I was going. And I know that, that, that that's all about pro bono services and all about getting access to justice for folks who are underserved. And th those kinds of ideas that they're discussing are, are brought to life through your commitment here, and I really, really appreciate it. Um, I am, if you're involved in this program, I'm somebody I'll be seeing from time to time, <clears throat> though very briefly. Um, as uh, was indicated, my name is Jim Snyder. I'm the judge in courtroom 1501. I'm the supervising judge of municipal jury trials for all causes of action in the first district under $50,000. Um, <clears> I handle motion practice, discovery practice, and the supervising judge of the arbitration center and assign the cases to judges such as Diane Shelley for trial. So you'll see me if you become involved in these cases. Your client perhaps has already seen me. The referral has perhaps come from the client's pro se appearance in my courtroom and uh, the people step up. And uh, I wanted to point out for your sake, Ms. Patel, I broke my hand. I fell in front of City Hall. <clears throat> 
It was City Hall in San Francisco, California. <laughs> I'm not aware of tort immunity over there, and I think it was my fault anyway. But <laughs> nonetheless, sorry, plaintiff lawyers, this, this $1,000 case is going to slip through your hands there because <laughs> it was my fault. Um, when you appear in court, courtroom 1501, you'll see it's a very busy environment with lots of rules and lots of acronyms, and you can imaz imagine that on occasion it's confusing for the judge, on occasion it's confusing for the lawyers, and so imagine still how confusing it must be for someone who is not a lawyer, somebody who doesn't have our training, somebody who has a language difficulty, and somebody who has a complete lack of familiarity with the court system. <clears throat> you being a translator and you being somebody involved in that, means everything to them, no matter how they're going to ca their case is going to start out. We have a standing order in our courtroom. It indicates the rules of the courtroom, what all these various acronyms mean, and how these cases are managed. <coughs> 1501 fu functions like an air traffic control system for the first municipal district. Um, I always say my job is to make sure none of the planes crash, and if they do, make sure no one survives. So <laughs> when you come through, step up and see our clerks. You'll be, you'll be uh, appearing on your first stop on our progress call. It's similar to 2005. The purpose of the call is to determine who is in the case and who is not, what defendants are in the case, who has been served, who's appeared for them, uh, what the status of third-party claims are, and uh, get the case ready to go toward discovery and toward trial. <clears throat> the parties step up and they fill out a progress call order. There'll be a recommendation from my clerks there are uh, seven courtroom clerks assigned to that courtroom now. There'll be recommendations from our clerks on the board indicating whether or not they believe the case is ready to go toward discovery, <coughs> whether there are parties that are not yet served. If you agree with the, the recommendation from the clerk that all the parties are in the case and it's time to go close discovery or set a discovery deadline, go ahead and fill out this order and give it to the clerk. If you think the recommendation from the clerk is wrong, such as the clerks have said the defendant is not served or some third party is not served and you believe they are, you ask to have the case called. If on the other hand, uh, the clerk believes there are service and there isn't service over your client, there isn't service over some party, um, or there's some kind of jurisdictional issue such as it doesn't belong in the first district at all, again, you step up and you see the clerk. Then in a run in mill case where everything is good to go, based on the addendum, you'll get a discovery closure deadline by filling out this form. The cases proceed through mandatory arbitration. Please get yourselves a copy of the arbitration rules, the 90 series, the Supreme Court Rule 90 series, regarding mandatory arbitration. There are copies of it in our courtroom that are available. It's, of course, available on the Supreme Court's website. <clears throat> it is the separate series of rules that regards mandatory arbitrations of claims and in particular a party's duty to participate in mandatory arbitration in good faith governed by Rule 90. You can get, you know, this is litigation. You can get hung up on that rule and it's fair game to uh, point it out if, you're, if your opponent has gotten hung up on that rule and the obligations of, of participating in good faith and what good faith participation means. <clears throat> Again, I'm not going to get into substantive motion practice. All substantive motion practices for these cases occur in, our, in my courtroom according to the motion schedule that will be in the standing order and following arbitration they're assigned to trial. Um, are we doing, we've done scenarios in the past, is that what we're doing now? Well, all right. A first appearance call and there are approximately 100 first appearances per day in our courtroom. So they tend to be very quickly. Folks, you all are lawyers. If I'm, here's the way I figure. You've got somewhere else to be. You've got a lot of things to attend to, and I'm, my obligation is to move your case as quickly as I can. If it's moving too quick and you're not getting the attention that you need, then it's your obligation to jump in and slow me down. So go right ahead. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Anna O'Connor for plaintiff. Good morning. Margaret Schneider for defendants. Good morning. Your Honor, this is our first appearance before you. Um, we have. Uh, served the insurance company Acme Insurance as well as the defendant Michael Smith in this case and I represent James Green. Is the insurance party the defendant? We um, inadvertently sued the insurance party. I believe defense counsel has a motion. We do. We have a motion to dismiss, Your Honor. And the claim is negligence claim? Yes, negligence car accident. We have no objection. There's no insurance code claim and plaintiff has no objection. Defense dismissed. And Your Honor, um, also 
Discovery is closing. However, it's a parked car case. We need to understand the owner or to determine who the uh, driver of the vehicle is and the owner of the vehicle. We like to conduct a limited discovery just for that purpose, Your Honor, to, um, to serve a couple interrogatories regarding the same. Michael Smith is the driver of the car. The owner was his mother, Mary Smith. I mean, if counsel wants to send an interrogatory, we'll be happy to answer that. But uh, I don't think there will be an issue with coverage. You want to enter that as an admission, that, my, that Michael's the driver, Mary's the owner, and Michael's a permissive user? Yes, Your Honor. Plaintiff? That's fine, Your Honor. Then I'd just like to um, enter that in the order as well, okay. the admission. Okay. Any other discovery issues? Um, no, we're ready to proceed with the next court date. Well, discovery closed today. And you'll get a notice in the mail from the Arbitration Center. I strongly recommend that you check your appearance with uh, on the computer system. The notice will go to you. The notice of arbitration will go to you as the address on your appearance as recorded by the clerk and entertain the possibility that the clerk has made an error in entering the appearance. So please double check it. Thank you. Yeah, and one last thing. Um, I know the arbitration dates are generally given a few months ahead of time. I do believe that my client might be on vacation in a couple months around the time that the arbitration is providing dates. In the event that my client cannot make it, is it okay that I come in on a motion to change that date? Yeah, though Monday through Thursday at 1.15, please look at the standing order, motions to continue arbitration. You'll get a date issued by the arbitration center in the mail. If you do not like that date, you can come in on a motion to change it. You, you can pick a date that's agreed between the two of you and come in and is agreed as well. If that date's available, you can have that date. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank okay, you, Honor. thank you. So again, thank you very much. That was a, that was a simplified version, but that happens about a hundred times a day, and I know, and then away you go. Um, thank you very much for your participation in the program. I'm happy to answer any questions, and if not, okay, thanks. Um, next on the agenda is the mandatory arbitration overview. I know you've heard a lot about this mandatory arbitration. So again, it is mandatory, but it's non-binding so long as your client shows up, as the party shows up, if there's a 237, and we'll get to that. So mandatory arbitration actually happens in this building. It's on the 13th floor of 222 North LaSalle, and um, you're going to get that arbitration date in advance. You're going to have that arbitration date within at least a month or two in advance. So again, if there is an issue, you can always go to 1501 and um, file a motion to continue the ARP for another date if that date doesn't work for your client or for you. Um, now, when you get to arbitration, there's going to be a panel of three attorneys, um, and those three attorneys will essentially judge um, the arbitration, the evidence that you present. Um, generally speaking, um, as Judge Schneider mentioned, be um, knowledgeable about Rule 90, especially Rule 90C. Rule 90C is an evidentiary packet that assists you in foregoing the rules of evidence by having this packet that you can give to the arbitrators so you don't have to go through the formalities of trying to enter an exhibit. And it kind of makes it a little more efficient at arbitration, a little swifter, a little quicker. So again, a 90C packet must have a title page. You have to list all your estimates, bills, that you have photographs in there, if there's an affidavit in there, and it cannot contain anything in inadmissible. So for instance, whatever you would um, possibly admit at a jury trial is something that you would like to admit in a 90C packet. But things that you cannot allow at, or that would not be admissible at a jury trial would not be admissible in a 90C, like a police report, because that's hearsay. Um, that's just one example of something that you would not be able to have in there. And again, at the, when you uh, appear at the arbitration, you're going to introduce yourself, you're going to introduce your, um, your party, the opponent's going to introduce themselves, you're going to pr present your 90C packet, and if you're a defense, you might not have a 90C packet, that's fine. Um, you always have the opportunity to either object to some uh, documents within someone's 90C packet, or you can say that you have no objection and you may proceed. Um, you also, I think it's really important for all of you to file a 237 notice. 237 notice are, is a document used, or is a rule, <laughs> or is a rule used, where you can uh, file a document saying that you want the party to be at that arbitration and any, um, any uh, estimates or any pictures or photographs, anything that you intend to use at a trial or arbitration, um, that party has to present them at that date and prior to that date so you can review them. 
if uh, your opponent does not show up at arbitration and you had a 237 notice for that party, then you could ask for bad faith. It's really important that to take note that if A, you have a 237, and B, that party does not show at arbitration, that you at least at minimum ask the arbitrators to make a finding of either A, bad faith, or B, to make a finding in the note that there's a 237 violation. In the event that you win an arbitration, which is likely the case if the party does not show and they violate 237, then that non-binding arbitration becomes binding. The award stands, they can't reject the award, you're done. So you have to really make sure to follow up with that rule, file that document. You're welcome to file that with your response to pleadings in the case. You can file it immediately. You can file it with your 90C, but make sure to do that. There's a deadline to file your 90C. It's within 30 days before the arbitration date. You can always get leave for further time if you need to by the court. There's other rules for the 90C, and I mentioned here to provide that you have an estimate or not. All your bills have to be outlined as paid or unpaid. It's really important. A lot of arbitrators are big sticklers about that. Um, this is a small um, rule, but a lot of arbitrators are sticklers about this as well. Make sure to number all your pages. You don't have to bait stamp them, but just number it literally one, two, three, four, five. When you have a, a medical um, dispute or medical damages or medical bills and records in a 90C, these 90Cs can get pretty hefty. So. Um, it's also advantageous to point out to the arbitrators that you have. Um, arbitrators, please look at page 36 and note that plaintiff had a prior accident in the past with, you know, with a knee injury, things like that. It just kind of makes it a little easier for your case as well. Um, so anyway, so you go to arbitration, you're sitting there, you give an opening statement. Defense counsel can waive their opening if they'd like, or they can provide just a short opening statement regarding what they believe the evidence will show. Then you'll have the right to call your first witness. You can cross-examine that next witness. And um, you proceed like you would as a trial, just it's a little more informal. You're sitting down at a table among, or across from your opponent. At the end, you give a closing. And after that, you're going to leave the room. The arbitrators are going to make a determination or a finding of an award. And then you actually are able to look at that award if you want after the arbitrators finish at the front of the arbitration center. They'll also um, send a, the arbitration award in the mail. And each party has 30 days to reject that award if they'd like to. As long as um, if there wasn't a bad rule or bad finding against them or bad faith, then they can reject the award and uh, proceed to a trial room. Also, sometimes you're going to come across a situation where, again, sometimes your client might be um, lost or they can't find the place or you just absolutely vanish from the face of the earth. And sometimes the clients in this program are transient. So you might lose an address, something might happen. In that situation, and if your opponent does have a 237 and they ask for bad faith, you want to make sure that you um, fight for your client. Obviously, you're there on behalf of your client. So you definitely want to say, you know, Your Honor, or I'm sorry, members of the panel, I'm here on behalf of my client. I gave an opening statement. I cross-examined on behalf of my client all the witnesses here today. I gave a meaningful, meaningful closing argument. I made points to validate my client's defense, and I'm asking you to step aside and not find the finding of bad faith for my client based on the meaningful defense that I provided today. So definitely make sure that you try to do that. And also, if you have a witness that can come, um, make sure that you know you try to get an affidavit. You're welcome to put an affidavit in a 90C packet for that witness. You don't have to have you know, a room full of witnesses and then have everybody come in all the way down to the, uh, to the arbitration center and spend a couple hours, worst case scenario, um, for their time. So you're welcome to throw in an affidavit, too. Um, usually, these proceedings take about 20 minutes to an hour. They can go as long as two hours. That's the limit. So are there any questions about the arbitration process at all? OK, thank you. OK, as you can see, we're getting ready for our mock um, arbitration demonstration for you. So we, us three here, are your uh, arbitrators today. And then we have all the parties. We'll introduce everybody shortly when everybody's ready. Let me get a console. Right here. 
Good afternoon, Council. Are you ready to proceed? Yes. Everyone signed in? Yes. Okay. Are there any uh, 90C packets? Yes, we've submitted a, um, a 90C that's before you. Any objections, Council? There are, uh, there are a couple of objections. Um, we went to court and the police report and the photographs have both been stricken. The police report is inadmissible as well as the photographs since there's no question as to the points of impact in this case. Do you have a copy of the order stating that? I do. Any further objections? No further objections. Okay. The police report and the photos will be stricken from the 90C packet based on the court order granted by Judge Schneider in 1501. Any objections, Council, or any other 90C packets? Defense has no 90C packet. Okay. Anyone uh, ready to proceed or any other questions before we start? We're ready to proceed. Okay. Opening. Lindsay Markley on behalf of the plaintiff. Um, your arbitrators were before the court today to talk about a property damage case wherein my client, Mr. James Green, was involved in an automobile collision with the defendant, Michael Smith, in Cook County, Chicago. You'll hear from my client's testimony today the facts that giving rise to the property damage claim that we're making. And I believe that at the conclusion of today, you will find in his favor with respect to what we've provided to you in our 90C package, um, the $320 that he's already expended out of pocket uh, with respect to his property damage. Um, and estimate number one and two, we're going to ask you to compensate him in the amount of estimate number one which is $1,857.75 for the damage to his vehicle, which included some undercarriage uh, damage. Thank you. Your Honor, I represent Michael Smith, the defendant in this case. The facts will show that plaintiff will be unable to prove that the defendant did anything that was negligent. Moreover, the estimates for damage that has been included in the 90C packet, the plaintiff's testimony will show that the claim damages are not all related to the accident in question. We'll ask at the end that you return a, an award in favor of the defendant. Plaintiff, first witness. Yes, the prosecution would like to call James Green to the stand. Mr. Green, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? You may proceed. Thank you. Mr. Green, would you please state your name? James Green. And what is your current address? 21 West 1st, Chicago, Illinois. Directing your attention to November 2nd, 2010, what, if anything, do you recall occurred on that date? I was in a car accident. What time of day were you involved in a car collision? It was in the afternoon. Do you know what time? I can't remember. I think it was after lunch. What road were you traveling on at the time that the collision occurred? I was on Kedzie. And what direction were you traveling on Kedzie? Northbound. How many lanes of travel are there for northbound travel on Kedzie? I think that there's two. And did you at some point come into contact with another vehicle? Yes. Did that happen at or near an intersection? Yes. What intersection did that um, collision take place at? At the intersection was 62nd. Is the intersection of Kedzie and 62nd regulated by any traffic control devices? There isn't anything on Kedzie. Uh, there is a stop sign on 62nd, I believe. Did you observe the defendant's vehicle before the collision occurred? Uh, just a split second before he hit me. I didn't, I didn't see it any time before that. What direction did you observe the defendant's vehicle traveling before the collision occurred? Or pardon me, at the time of the collision? He was traveling uh, eastbound on 62nd and trying to make a left onto Kedzie. Did you observe the defendant come to a stop before entering into the inter intersection of 62nd and Kedzie? No. And you had testified before that there is a stop sign regulating traffic as it enters onto Kedzie from 62nd Street, correct? Yes. What part of your vehicle contacted the other vehicle? It was the front left uh, driver's side of my car. And what portion of the defendant's vehicle contacted your vehicle? It was the front of his car. Could you describe the impact for the panel? It was, uh, since I only saw him right before the impact, I, would, I didn't really have time to brace myself. Um, it was a, I would describe it as a hard impact. Was there damage to your vehicle as a result of the impact? Yes. 
Could you please describe that damage to the jury, or pardon me, to the panel? Uh, there was damage to the front end uh, where, where I was hit. Um, and then after I was hit, my car was pushed up onto a sidewalk. And uh, the underside was damaged as a result of scraping onto the curb or sidewalk. I'm not sure. As a result of that undercarriage damage, was there any damage to the engine of your car? Objection leading. Response. I don't think that was leading. I'm asking for information if there was any damage to the underside of his vehicle. Yes. And have you to date had the had any of the damage to your vehicle repaired? Yes, I had some uh, work done on the brakes and wheel cylinders. And directing your attention to um, what we've put forward to the panel and uh, directing the panel as well, um, is the $320 receipt from mufflers and brakes complete auto repair the receipt that you received after you paid for your um, repairs? Yes. And how did you pay for that amount? I paid in cash. Okay. Did you have all of the damage to your vehicle repaired? No, that was the only thing I've had done. Did you have um, anyone prepare an estimate with respect to the damage of your vehicle? Yes, I had two estimates. Okay. And what was the first estimate? The first estimate was uh, for the front end damage, and that was uh, $1,857 and change. And it looked like there was a second estimate. Could you tell the panel why there was a second estimate performed? And the second estimate was for the uh, underside damage to the vehicle. And I think that that was uh, $1,750 and change. Okay. It's also, um, pardon me, strike my question. Did you incur any additional damages as a result of the collision? Yes, I, my car was inoperable uh, as a result of the collision. So I had to uh, get bus passes for almost eight months um, after the collision. And what is your normal mode of transportation? Driving my car. And do, what do you use your vehicle for? Um, personal use to get to and from work and other things. Is $828, um, as we put forward before the panel, the amount that you spent on bus passes for the eight months that your vehicle was inoperable as a result of this collision? Yes, and I also uh, had to spend some money to get rides from friends as well. How much did you have to pay your friends to drive you places? $60. Okay. I have no further questions. Mr. Green, you only saw the defendant's vehicle a split second before the impact occurred, correct? Yes. And at the points of impact for your vehicle were the front driver's side, correct? Yes. There was no damage to the rear of your vehicle, correct? No. There's no damage to the right side of your vehicle, correct? Nope. I have no further questions. Thank you. Any other witnesses? No, you're, no we'll, we'll rest at this time. And I have no redirect. Defense? Defense rests at this time. Closing? The evidence has shown, as presented in our 90C package, and my client's very competent and credible testimony, that on November 2nd, 2010, Mr. Green was involved in an automobile collision as a result of Mr. Smith's negligence. Um, it is undisputed that traffic traveling on Pulaski, Kedzie, does not have a, any traffic control devices as it passes through the intersection with 62nd. As you heard my client testify, and um, no one is disputing, traffic on 62nd Street has a stop sign as it enters into that intersection. If the defendant had stopped at the stop sign, they would have seen my client's vehicle passing through the intersection at that time and been able to avoid this automobile collision, which has caused my client to sustain property damages. Therefore, I ask that you find in my, my client's favor on the issue of liability and move forward into the damage um, and compensating him for the damage that he incurred. The $888 that he incurred as a result of bus passes, or pardon me, bus passes and rides with friends, we ask that you compensate him in that amount. The $320 that he has paid in cash for repairs to his vehicle, and we ask that you compensate him in the amount of estimate number one, which is the more inclusive estimate um, in the amount of $1,857.75. Thank you.
plaintiff testified that he did not see the defendant's vehicle except for a split second before the accident occurred. There's no dispute here that an accident occurred, but the plaintiff has to show more than just an accident occurred. It has to show evidence that there was, in fact, negligence on the part of the defendant. Plaintiff has provided no evidence or testimony to support that the defendant did anything that was negligent outside the ordinary care of a driver. Um, therefore, plaintiffs failed to show that the defendant was, in fact, liable for any property damage she suffered. Uh, moreover, looking at the estimates, plaintiff's testimony was that the defendant's vehicle came in contact with the front driver's side of his vehicle. Taking a look at the mufflers and brakes complete auto repair, Damage there is to the rear wheel cylinders, rear brake shoes, rear drums, and rear hardware kit. Plaintiff clearly testified that there was no damage done to the rear of his vehicle. As for estimate number one, the second half of those line items show that he's request, he requested to have his right headlamp replaced, his right wheel, his right tire. Plaintiff clearly testified that there was no damage done to the right side of his car, therefore, these damages are not related to the accident and should not be considered in the panel's award if they choose to award the plaintiff any money. Thank you. The law requires that a driver yield when a stop sign or a traffic signal regulates traffic entering into an intersection. The panel is allowed, much like a jury will be, should we try this case, to use its common sense in determining whether or not a vehicle pulled into an intersection in front of my client after yielding the stop sign. If in fact this panel does find that my client's testimony is not enough to find that the defendant does not stop, that's unnecessary in order to find in favor of my client. It is negligent to have failed to look to the left and observe that a vehicle was traveling in the direction of this intersection, therefore yielding the right of way to my client. With respect to the damage estimates, um, the 90C package speaks for itself. We've prepared, I am not a, an engineer or a car repairs person, but I have relied upon the estimates that are prepared by both my client's insurance company as well as um, the defendants, and that's actually marked clearly on our documents within the arbitration package. So I will let the panel make their decision. However, we would ask that you compensate my, t my client completely and totally, which would require um, estimate number one, the $320 that he used to repair his vehicle, and the $888 for incidental damages arising from the inability of him to use his vehicle. Thank you. Quick question, was there a 237 for the defendant? Um, no, Your Honor, counsel and I spoke beforehand, and I felt that it was unnecessary for um, her client to be present. Very well, thank you. You'll get an award at the end, and um, you have, again, 30 days to reject it, and please keep in mind the JOA date of August 2nd, 2013. Thank you. Are there any questions on the uh, mock arbitration? And if you didn't catch that at the end, what Anna was doing is I could have moved um, under 237, and, and I, recently my office won. We're not in Muni too often, but my associate over here actually won, right? Didn't you win that? Um, uh, a 237 uh, notice to produce, to produce a finding of bad faith against the defendants, and so we, they were unable to reject the arbitration award. Um, but I spoke to, to uh, defense counsel before this. I agreed that it wasn't a bad thing to only have my client's testimony, and that's why at this arbitration I didn't move to, uh, to have her barred from rejecting the ARB pursuant to 237. Thank you, everybody. Also, a great point of advice to um, if and when you do go to arbitration, you have the opportunity to see an arbitration for yourself as well. The arbitration hearings in the 13th floor of this building are public hearings. So you're welcome to check in and ask to see a, a property damage or a contract dispute arbitration, and you're welcome to sit in there and watch. And I highly recommend it. A, it'll make you a little more relaxed for yours and a little more prepared, and B, you can just really see how it's done. So I highly, highly recommend that. Any other questions before we uh, break out into our sessions? Many. The same thing can be said for 1501. And Absolutely. Feel free, to, feel free to go into 1501 and watch uh, what happens. One thing that wasn't mentioned um, that I think I found really 
sort of overwhelming. My first time going to 1501 is if you're there for the 930 status call, it isn't a call. They don't call out every number. So outside of 1501, there is a board that has all of your cases. They're numbered. For the 930 call, if you need to step up in front of the judge, they'll say things like answer call. They'll just give you an ADC date. It says answer call. Go up, tell the judge that your line number, whatever, and he'll, whether it's a progress call and you need some more time to get service or whatnot, that'll be done. If it just says ADC and a date, you just get a form order. They're to the left side of the room. It's an all discovery closure order. You fill out the date, you get the order entered. If you go into a 10 o'clock, 10.30, or 11 o'clock call, you will sit in the courtroom and you'll wait for your number to be called and then your motion or whatever it is will be heard. Any questions on that? Thank you, everybody. We'll break off into groups and think Megan's going to, to um, explain our next portion of this training. Um, okay, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, proving damages, which are the most important part of any plaintiff's case and defending against damages and liability are, of course, from the defense standpoint. Um, you might know a little bit about me if you were in my arbitration room um, and from earlier. I am a plaintiff's personal injury attorney. I'm with Harmon, Fedek, and Markley. I became an equity partner at my law firm, which has been around for 60 years um, in August of 2011. I started out my career as a defense uh, insurance defense attorney at Query and Harrow. Um, I practiced primarily in their DuPage office and probably did maybe somewhere in the vicinity of 50 arbitrations at that time. And then I tried eight law division cases. I flipped to the plaintiff's side. I've tried approximately 25 jury trials to verdict. Of those, one has been a municipal case. However, my office is sometimes a municipal and a jury trial is a jury trial. Um, most of mine have been on the longer side, um, uh, usually around a week or two weeks. Um, but any jury trial is going to take preparation, and the issues are the same, even if the amount of time is not. Um, so that's a little bit about my background. Um, and also, my office is located right in this building. We're on the fourth floor. So if you're ever heading over for um, an arbitration and you're confused or you need some copies made or you just need help, please feel free to stop in. We're in suite 430 and I am the plaintiff's liaison. So if you have a plaintiff's case, feel free to contact me and ask me any questions that you'd like. This isn't easy. Um, it's not something that you can do without help and resources and I welcome um, any questions that you have. So damages, um, we've talked a lot about liability and we talked about a small claims case. I don't do any property damage, so um, more of what I'm going to discuss is from a personal injury standpoint. However, the issues with bills are the same whether it's a personal injury matter or a property damage matter. Um, people get so caught up in liability and one of the reasons that Megan asked me to speak about um, liens and damages is that we found that the conversation constantly turned to liability. Liability is really important, but if you're a plaintiff's personal injury attorney um, or a defense attorney, if liability is found in your favor, you've got a the most important part of your case where you make the money, where you recover on behalf of your client, and that is the most important part to your client. Um, good for you, you want on liability, they want to see what what they're actually going to be compensated. Um, I have kind of, I did an, an outline um, which is in tab 14. It's very detailed and I'm not going to go directly off of that because it, it is pretty detailed and what you need to know, but I never call um, damages at the conclusion of trial an award. I never ask a jury to award my client anything. I feel that an award is something you win and compensation is what I ask a jury for. Um, I have done motions in limine to prevent the defendants from calling compensation for my client an award. I have been successful. I've also been unsuccessful and gone forward and in my closing said, my client's not asking you to award him anything. He would really prefer to have not broken his arm and had surgery and have plating in it. Um, so what we'd like you to do is compensate him. And um, that's just my personal belief. I know many plaintiff's attorneys who call them awards and, and that works for them. But for me, automatically in our day and age where people are cynical, they're suspicious, um, my plaintiff's client is usually the least credible person in the, in the 
courtroom, followed by a close second with myself because I am a plaintiff's attorney and they are making assumptions about me from the second that I walk in. Um, and I would say the defense attorney is the third least credible person in the room. Everyone else is considered credible, which is why independent witnesses are so important in proving up your case. Um, and that's unfortunate, but that's just the day and age we live in and when I talk to juries, what I find. So why is it so important to prove up damages? Well, that's where you get the money amounts in your cases. Um, just briefly, we, when we talk about damages, we're talking about economic damages, and we're talking about non-economic damages, and I normally jury uh, veneer on non-economic damages a lot more than economic damages, because as you would assume, most people are much more bothered by compensating someone for pain and suffering than they are for medical. So when I talk about um, damages, it encompasses money damages, pain and suffering, um, and uh, things that I would consider to be a part of pain and suffering. For instance, if you're going for emotional distress, which is really rare disability or loss of normal life, um, disfigurement. Those are things that are more difficult to talk about and you're likely, even in a muni case, going to want to have someone other than your client testifying to them. Um, proving up medical and property damages are identical in that a paid bill is presumed to be reasonable and customary. So an unpaid bill, you have three things you need to be proving when you're putting a bill before the, um, the jury or on a, at a bench trial. And this is taken away during arbitration, which is why ARBs are so great, because you don't have to do any of the foundation laying that you'll have to do at jury trial. Um, at jury trial, if you have a, a bill period, in order to get it before the jury and ask for compensation, you have to show that it's reasonable, customary, and proximately related. So three separate things. And reasonable and customary usually go together, or the type of, um, uh, the manner in which you prove that is going to be together, and related is usually separate from that. So a paid bill is presumed reasonable and customary. So for instance, property damage, your client paid $1,800 in property damage, and they have the estimate, it's presumed reasonable, you just present that at trial unpaid bills are not presumed reasonable and customary. So you have to have someone come in who's going to testify to the fact that that bill is reasonable and customary or you are not going to be able to get it in. There's a couple different ways to handle that. Um, and, and I've put in here the case law. So there's dispute and I still have um, defense counsels bringing in motions saying that even though the majority of the bill is paid, that it's not completely discounted for purposes of um, presuming it reasonable and customary. But my reading of the law is under Arthur versus Couture, which says that if a portion of a bill is paid, it's considered completely discharged. So let's say that insurance came in and paid $1,000 of that $1,800 estimate, and it's considered completely discharged. So there's not an outstanding $800 amount. It's totally done because insurance got a deal. Under the law, under Arthur versus Couture, my position would be that bill is completely paid. A good defense attorney or a vigilant one is probably going to come in and argue that it is not. Um, I think that the law is pretty clear, but some judges are still finding um, that that $800 doesn't come in, and so the $1,000 would. I disagree with that, but I would urge you to read that case law, and I've cited it. Um, this is extended to public aid, so Arthur versus Couture dealt with private insurance. And then it was turned to, is someone on welfare entitled to the same benefit? So if public aid pays $500 of a $50,000 medical bill, is it considered, and it's completely discharged, is it considered paid for um, reasons of foundation? And the answer is yes, under Wills versus Foster, or I would argue that it is. Um, if the client owed an amount, let's say $1,500 for a deductible, they're still going to owe that amount. So, um, or that's still considered unpaid. That's outside of um, the amount that insurance, that's considered um, something that you're going to need to bring someone in. There's just all these pitfalls that you need to be ready for if you're going to be putting on a damages case. And I've listed some of the ways that you can do a prove up of unpaid medical bills. You can do 216s. Um, people talk about these a lot, and basically it's asking the other side, this is discovery to some degree, so you are going to have, if this is small claims, you can't just issue 216s, you'd have to go in and say, Your Honor, we've got, you know, X amount in bills, we'd like to be able to put them forward, can we issue a 216? Um, I would recommend reading um, Supreme Court Rule 216, it's very helpful 
and uh, in the small claims instance, you'd have to have leave of court. I don't know where Muni falls with um, an all discovery closure date and two sixteens. Do you know? It, are you allowed to issue two sixteens after an all discovery closure date? Okay. I would recommend going in on and asking for leave to issue them just to make sure that you don't get in any trouble. And you want to go that route first. Um, the second way is getting them in through a treating physician or let's say you're talking property damage. A lot of people think that an expert witness has to be someone very fancy or with some certain magical degree. They don't. An expert is someone with an expertise in any area. So let's say you are that attorney, you know, Mike Green's attorney or Jimmy Green's attorney trying to get in the property damage estimate, you can call your normal, ordinary um, vehicle repair guy or your dad. Um, and your dad, you can lay a foundation for him. You know, dad, you've been fixing cars for 30 years. Yeah, I have been. They're probably going to attack the credibility of that one. But it's just to say you can get creative with laying the foundation. Um, and the point of that would be not only is the bill reasonable and customary, but then the second question, is it related? Um, you know, is the type of damage, and you heard the defense attorney doing a great job of saying cylinders, front damage, you have to be able to show to the jury why they're compensating the person for that amount. Um, if you have a doctor's testimony, that can take care of the related aspect of bills, but if you don't, your client's own testimony can Use, be used to have circumstantial evidence that that bill is related. So they were transported from the scene of the collision by ambulance to the emergency room where they stayed for one week. You don't want to bring in an ER doc because you're working pro bono. You don't want to rack up a bunch of costs on the case. It's not free to get a doctor in. Um, so instead, you have your client testify that he was taken from the scene by ambulance to the emergency room. And then you have either a bill person come in and testify to the reasonable and customary, you have your 216s or it's paid. Those are just a couple ways. Does anyone have any questions on that? It's pretty complicated um, and it's not exactly the sexiest part of a jury trial, but it is one of the most important. Yeah. Um, I've actually had that not work. You have? Yes. I've had it work against me. I, I, it, I think it really depends. And I, there is new um, rules of evidence saying that, and I've done the affidavit, but I've had to have the um, defense counsel stipulation on it. Um, in fact, in McHenry County, I had 25 jury, or 25 bill um, collectors who were, or bill issuers who were lined up to testify. I got through six of them before the defense counsel called uncle. And uh, we, we finally got out. I mean, it was the most boring testimony that anyone has ever heard, but you have to do it. So yeah, that, that is one angle, but I, I would maybe talk to, uh, to defense counsel or plaintiff's counsel, depending on what the situation is, and figure out, can you stipulate um, if you get affidavits, just so you don't run into a problem. Um, the next aspect of resolving a case or damages is something that I get the most phone calls on as a plaintiff's liaison. How am I doing on time, Megan? Am I okay? Um, would be the liens aspect um, or subrogation interests. This is something that most people have never even heard of and it is the most difficult aspect of my job from the standpoint of attempting to resolve a lawsuit. Um, a lien is an unpaid bill by which the person who has issued the bill, the hospital, the doctor, has put a lien on the file and has given my office notice or you notice as the pro bono attorney and said, hey, your client owes me five grand and when you resolve this case, I'm going to get five grand. It's a lien because it attaches to your client no matter what happens. A subrogation interest is a interest that arises from what's called the common fund doctrine. So Blue Cross Blue Shield insures my client, they've paid $5,000. They send me their sub notice of their subrogation and I have to pay them back if I resolve the case. That subrogation interest goes away if I get a not guilty. I mean, there's nothing, there's, or if I drop the case. My client can be sued for the lien. Um, and liens are very complicated, especially now that we're talking about Medicare and Medicaid. Um, Medicaid public um, payments from the state of Illinois, very simple to deal with. 
you will definitely come across public aid working pro bono. A lot of your clients will have um, either public aid or Medicare. Medicare is a totally different ball game, and I've included um, the website that you're required to go to for Medicare. Um, it is a very complicated, very precise, very lengthy process, and if you fail to resolve a Medicare lien, pardon me, subrogation interest, your firm is liable for it. So that is an error that you will likely not be able to live down. Um, you know, the good deed that you did just, uh, you know, kind of, because really going back to the client after you hand them their check and going, uh, hey, um, you owe five grand of Medicare, and they're like, uh, no. So um, some people will talk about set-asides. Th those are not relevant in personal injury cases. Um, they are only applicable to workers' comp, and we're not talking about that here. So just be very vigilant. You want to find out if the bills are paid, how are they paid. If Medicare paid them, go to the website that I've listed at the bottom. It's Medicare Federal Government, www.cms.gov. They have documentation and, and forms that you have to fill out. Send them into Medicare and get the ball rolling right away because when you want to resolve the lawsuit, you actually have to have Medicare's approval. Um, Medicaid, not so much. They're very easy to work with. Hey, I have a $5,000 offer. You guys have a $10,000 um, interest. They're going to work with you. Medicare is not going to work with you. It's the federal government. I mean, they just they work totally differently. Um, it can literally take six weeks to six months, and your client cannot receive their funds until that's resolved. And I've actually had to try cases because the Medicare lien couldn't be resolved. So just something to keep in mind. Um, other issues with settlement or resolution, because ultimately, even though everyone wants to try a jury trial, what you're hoping for is to be able to compensate your client, and the safest way to do that is to resolve the case outside of court. So you're hoping that you get a settlement offer that is good enough that you actually don't have to take the case to trial because handing your client some cash is a lot better than handing them a not guilty, which can happen and happens frequently in this day and age. Um, if your client's a minor, you need to look into um, the rules for Cook County on handling a minor. There's probate estates. There's an exception for anything under $10,000. However, if your client's going to be taking home over 10 grand, then um, they have to have a probate estate opened in Cook County. There's also approval that has to occur by Judge Maddox um, for the resolution of any case involving a minor. So, and that's all listed in the in the uh, local court rules. Um, if there's workers' comp involved, that's something to be looking out for. They're entitled to 75% payback. In most of your cases, that shouldn't be um, a concern. However, if it is, they're entitled to 75% of their payback, if, even if it means that the client takes home zero. So if you um, assume that they'll work with you, they don't have to. And I've also tried cases because the comp lien couldn't be resolved. Um, SSDI, Social Security Disability, this, these are definitely um, things you might come across. Someone who's living off of what's called SSDI, um, which is disability benefits paid out um, that you pay into. So you've worked a certain amount, the government's taken your money, and now you're injured and they're paying you back. Uh, a settlement is not going to affect those, but if one of your clients is, is SSI, which is disability payments based on financial need, then any personal injury um, settlement amount can affect those benefits. Probably not in the types of cases that you're trying, but you never know and you just want to make sure you explore that because you don't want your client to call you six months from now and say, hey, you know, um, my disability in, um, attorney called me, they found out about this lawsuit and now my benefits are disrupted. So just things that you need to be thinking about. Um, personal injury law, uh, any settlement amount for the client is tax free. Um, not so much for the attorney, I mean, I know it's pro bono, but because it's compensation. However, a lot of people ask me that. They say, well, you know, do I have to report this? Well, it's tax-free. Um, so because it's considered compensation for pain and suffering, the only time you're going to have to pay taxes if you're um, a plaintiff is if it's specifically itemized for wage loss. So I usually avoid any um, acknowledgement of a wage loss claim in any releases, just to avoid any problems down the road. Um, so, now that I've given the most boring part of today, does anyone have any questions based on that? No? Okay. So, well, good luck and feel free to call me uh, if you have any questions. Like I said, this is a very complicated aspect and what I consider to be one of the most important. So, and I think what most attorneys would. So, um, thank you very much for your time today and thank you so much for doing this program. It's really awesome.
Hello, uh, my name is Scott Sakiyama. I'm a litigation associate at Winston & Strawn. And uh, I just before I get started, I wanted to just mention that um, a lot of the people I know in our firm who've had these cases uh, have absolutely run into the problem that they have a client who won at the arbitration, but they have unpaid either. It's almost always um, uh, their car's total and they haven't been able to get it fixed. And so uh, proving up those damages, I think, is you know, comes up all the time. Um, so, uh, so anyway, uh, I've been asked to come here and speak today um, about the experience I had uh, with this program. Um, I graduated from law school in 2010 and started work at Winston & Strawn in January of 2011. Uh, in February, a month after I started, I took a, uh, took a case. Um, there were two cases that came up uh, that, we could, that we could hop on and I wanted case A but was told only case B was available and the catch was that you had to appear in court the next day and uh, neither the partner who was supervising me nor our pro bono counsel was available and so I showed up at the, the court call and suddenly realized that after three years of law school I had never actually seen a, uh, a status call uh, and so I had no idea what was going on. Uh, I did know that my client who I met for the first time there had been litigating the case pro se for three years and so I you know, had a question about something that was going on and so I turned and asked him about a certain procedure, um, which instantly sort of I realized that that was not the most confidence-inspiring thing I could have done. Uh, and in fact, he said to me, but he, he was very nice, he said, it's okay that you don't know the procedure in this court. And I said, well, I've, I've never appeared in this court before. Um, not really acknowledging that I'd never appeared in any court before. But uh, at any rate, uh, so we, we, set a, we set a trial date for two months out. Um, and uh, as I started to go through the case, I realized that my client had actually done quite well for himself. Uh, he had managed to seek discovery, even though he was small claims. And when the other side refused to answer, uh, his his uh, interrogatories and some of his other written discovery, he actually um, eventually, uh, through motions to compel, had them sanctioned so that the defendant was barred from testifying. So we were looking at a pretty strong case. Uh, it was going to be his testimony. He had been uh, in his car, stopped, rear-ended. Um, the other guy had gotten out and said, oh, I'm sorry I ran into you. Uh, so we, uh, we, we did some witness preparation. We got ready. We, we tried to settle the case. It didn't look like it was going to settle, even though the um, the amounts we were we weren't very far apart in in absolute terms but percentages we were we were very far apart and what had basically happened as as I worked the case up was that uh, you know my client had felt like he um, he didn't do anything wrong he was just stopped in traffic and somebody rear-ended him and he he wanted the repairs done at a shop he trusted and the other side uh, the insurance company had offered to pay 75 percent of of what the estimate was and he really felt like he was in a position that he was being pushed around because he he lacked resources um, and that the other side was just trying to force him to accept less money than he was owed. Um, he had actually uh, paid paid uh, paid the bills, so we didn't have the issue of proving up those damages. Um, but so we we worked the case up. We got ready. Uh, we we went to uh, we showed up the day day of. Um, couldn't settle uh, the case despite uh, it was in front of Judge Shelley, um, and so she, you know, despite her best efforts um, uh, to encourage us to settle the uh, the small claims case, um, uh, it it didn't didn't go it didn't settle. So we we impaneled a jury, picked a jury, um, got to to put on his testimony, um, and uh, at one point at the beginning of the trial, there was one uh, just one little legal uh, wrinkle. Um, that would have been sort of dispositive to the case. Uh, and so there was a big, big sort of argument in front of the judge, and uh, we, we got a ruling in our favor so the case could go forward. And at that point, when I sit, sat down, my client turned to me and said, okay, I couldn't have done that, so I'm glad you're here. Uh, so I felt like I was adding value for him at that point. But uh, at any rate, uh, we tried the case. We did uh, opening statements, put on his testimony. Um, did closing closing arguments. Um, the jury jury retired, and it took them about 45 minutes. I think they really only needed 15, but they were eating lunch. Um, but anyway, they came back and awarded us 100% of what we were seeking. And the um, uh, it, you know my client was 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 very happy. Uh, as we were leaving the courthouse, Judge Shelley turned um, sort of he, she was still on the bench, and we were walking out, and she she sort of called out. She said, "Mr. Moore, um, that was my client's name. He said, you know, Mr. Moore." I see you finally had your day in court today. And when she said that, he started to, to tear up a little bit. And this was, he's sort of, an, sort of an older, more reserved 
man. Um, but she'd really hit the nail on the head as far as what he was looking for. He wanted, he wanted justice. He wanted to make the courts work for him. He felt like he was in the right. And he got a jury of his peers to come back and say, yes, we agree. Um, you didn't do anything wrong. You should be paid what you're owed. And so I think this program is a great opportunity. And I hope that you can all go out and help your clients get their day in court. Thank you. Well, that concludes our program. Thank you again to Vetter Price, especially Ann Hopkins Avery, uh, working with us and making this fourth training possible. I'll stay for a little bit if anybody has questions. Um, I was also told that the Chicago Bar Foundation's Young Professionals Board is having their par bar tonight at 5.30. Um, if anybody wants to participate at, at that, I think Shilpa is going to be there, as well as Elise Wu, who you saw speak tonight. So. Thank you again, and I look forward to working with you on a case, I hope, soon.